Welcome back to another episode of Ramiumptum Ruminations. I'm the host, Scott. Today's episode is a continuation of last week's. From BYU Faculty to Apostate. An interview with Kaisa Berlin Kaufusi, Part 2. Thanks for coming back to this to the second part of this interview I had with Kaisa Berlin Kaufusi. She is a lovely, articulate woman, and I enjoyed greatly this second discussion that we had. We delved a bit deeper into some of the topics that we briefly discussed in the previous episode, and of particular note, Kaisa goes into great detail about what exactly happened that caused her to part ways with BYU. Without any more delay, on to the interview. I am so excited to be back here with my new friend, Kaisa Berlin Kaufusi. If you missed last week's episode, please, please go back and listen to our discussion. We cover some excellent topics. Kaisa is a lovely, educated, thoughtful, and articulate woman. She knows, she knows her scriptures. She's spiritual. She worked for CES. We talked about in the prior episode, we talked about her joining the CES program, her aspirations, and her background before she got into the program. We ended the episode talking a little bit about religious deconstruction and what it was like for her as a professor deconstructing Christianity and traditional orthodoxy while teaching at BYU. We got a little sidetracked, and that might happen again. So I apologize, but. We didn't get all the way through her story of her exit from the CES program. And I want to get to that as a second part today. And then we'll discuss where she is spiritually. We might have touched a a few of those those subjects on the previous episode, but but I want to ask her some, some more probing questions about where she stands now. Because oftentimes, people that deconstruct Christianity and religion, they eschew all of belief altogether. And I want to present someone who has maintained some belief and what that might look like for you as a listener. Kaisa, thank you so much for giving me more of your time for coming back. Welcome to Ramiumptum Ruminations. So glad to be here. And it's my pleasure. I, I love to. Yeah. Well, you have an open invitation. You are amazing. <laughs> Yay. Okay, good. You <laughs> might there's... regret that. That's right. <laughs> well, some of the things that, that we had mentioned just in passing, I think we could talk about at length, just those, those small subjects. Whenever you're interested, we can jump right okay. back into this. Great. Wonderful. So we left off last time talking about the beginning of your deconstruction. So here you are, you're a professor at CES as a woman married with kids, which is crazy. I'm still kind of blown away by this. But here you are, you've deconstructed, and you're trying your best to teach the kids while you don't believe in the complete orthodoxy. All right. Well, that's a, I mean, that's a great launching off point. Let's dive deep into that water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're, we're jumping. We're jumping in quick this time. <laughs> we're doing it. So I think I had created in my mind. So again, I started teaching courses in the fall of 2014, uh, continue to teach them up until spring semester of 2020 with COVID. And I'll go into that a little bit about how everything just kind of blew up at that point. You were still teaching at the beginning of COVID. I was. Wow. I didn't, I didn't realize your time frame was that recent. Yeah. It's kind of an interesting uh, conjunction there, right? Like yeah. with the, everything in the world blowing up and then everything in my paradigm blowing up. Yeah. So <laughs> crazy. Yeah, ironic. Um, but I, I think as I was teaching, based on my lived experience up to that point and my academic background, I was very comfortable being in kind of that nuanced place where I didn't necessarily fully align with all of the orthodox tenets or faith claims of the church. And I, I had created a place for myself where I assumed that was okay. 
Um, because the more you get to know other people, uh, the more you learn about general authorities' lives, um, the lives of the prophets, the modern prophets and the apostles, uh, and the more you have these dialogues with your colleagues, you realize you're not alone. Um, we all have things that we're very, very passionate about and strong on as far as our personal witnesses. And we all have things that we're a little bit more nuanced on. And it varies from person to person. And I had become very comfortable accepting the fact that we all relate to God a little differently. And so for some, there's going to be elements of gospel structure or policy that don't sit so well with some folks, but that really do sit well with others. And there's going to be some hardliners here that we're going to have to deal with. And um, there are going to be some people who are slackers that we're going to have to deal with, you know, <laughs> in my own perspective, right? How can I, who's to say who's a slacker? But um, I think for me, I'd come to a place where I thought, this is all part of the great journey where we are all rough stone rolling, rough stones rolling, and we are all bumping up against each other. And as we bump up against one, one another, we are refining each other. And that is, that is Zion. Like we will get there because we're all in this journey together. As Paul said, you know, looking through a glass darkly, um, if those are the words. So it made sense to me. I love that. Yeah. It made sense to me. Um, because I had gone from a place where I realized things aren't so black and white. The whitewash narrative of the church history isn't the actual history. And then it kind of set me into a panic mode. And then I really dug my heels in, focused on my spirituality and orthodoxy. And then I got to a place where I realized, I think that's okay. It doesn't necessarily matter. And maybe this is how it's supposed to be. And so that's where I was at the time. As I entered the classroom for BYU as a faculty member, I was kind of at a place where I was embracing the mess if that's if that makes sense so you're going into these classes with these kids that expect orthodoxy and you go in with nuance what was that like for you i mean i can't imagine that it was easy <laughs> i'm actually scott i'm so glad you said that because i would have forgotten to share the story um i would say for the most part it was exactly what they wanted i think they were starved for fresh perspectives i think a lot of them had come out of the the seminary system and they were, had been treated like children and kind of spoon fed a narrative that they're like, come on, like these kids are smart. Again, they have access to their smartphones. Like they're not going to buy it the way that it's been taught for the last 70 years. Like, and, and if their teaching hadn't been adjusted or if their instructor hadn't adjusted their teaching, they're coming to me starved, right? For some deep spirituality. They wanted to grapple with the nuance. They wanted to address the struggles. And I was ready and willing to do that. Um, but I did have a few students who would just balk at it. Um, and in my in my student ratings, you know, at the end of the semester, they would, they would hit on that. Um, but I actually found that as I would sit in council with um, my like academic superiors, what I'm trying to think. Now, just to recap for those that missed episode one, she worked in the ancient scripture department Correct. at uh -huh. BYU and yeah. not part of SNI. Correct. So just to be clear, so it's a little bit different. So I was never trained in seminaries and institutes. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So as I would sit, you know, and review uh, with the, the chair or whoever the chair had assigned to kind of oversee me as a young uh, academic in the department. And you were young at this time. You would have been, you would have been, at least when you started, you know, late twenties. So you were yeah. still young. Yeah. So when I was hired, I was 28. You were definitely right at the age of many of these kids. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. Because when you're teaching at a university level, every now and then you've got some really young overachiever kid, right? Like sometimes I'd have a 17 year old in my class or, <laughs> but, and I'd say at the, and the, I had people all the way up to in their fifties and sixties on average, most kids were mid to late twenties. So, and they're not kids, obviously. So you would have been a peer of many of these kids. I was. And actually that presented some challenges, especially with the young men. I can imagine. It did <laughs> like, oh, we'll, we'll get there. But yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, again, I think because as an instructor with BYU, we're all kind of at the university level. And so when students would balk in my unorthodox style, all it would take is a little conversation with my overseers and 
overseers. Sounds like name is wrong. Um, those people reviewing I'm my sorry. my ratings, and they'd realize, oh, she's fine. She's not doing anything too crazy, and this is good for the students. They need to open up their perspective. But I did receive a phone call once from the department because they had to technically share this with me. But they also said, don't, we're not overly concerned, but maybe you could, you know, try and do this a little more gently. There was an older Latina student who was very upset that I had suggested reading a different translation besides the King James. And I had tried to explain to her that this is what church employees actually are paid to do. Um, Again, my father, he was a scripture translation supervisor. You better believe he had dozens of translations on his office shelf. Well, the great irony is the King James version is it's so bad. Good. It's I so know. bad. I, I think so many people just assume because it's the official uh, translation that the church uses that somehow it's the best, which is funny because I think you would know more than I would. I think the church now has their own Spanish translation. They don't even use the King James for Spanish, do they? Now, when I when I served my mission, and this was back in 2006, 2008, they used... La Reina Valera version. Mm. You know, I've never dug too much into the history of that, but they they actually in Spanish use a different version than the King James. And I I remember reading the King James and as a missionary, reading both the King James and La Reina Valera versions side by side and seeing dramatic differences <laughs> in the uh, in the translations. And yeah. more often than not, I would I would lean towards the Spanish translation than the English one because one, it was in a more contemporary, although still antiquated, but a more contemporary version of Spanish. So the words were a little easier to understand, but also it just made more sense. Yeah. Which again, if you are, I think a more spiritual person and uh, a little more rooted in your own capacity to, to find truth, that's awesome right? That's cool that you can get different insights from various translations. But for many who view things very black and white, it's troubling. Yeah. Because what does that mean? And one of my biggest issues with uh, church structure is this idea of outsourcing our spirituality, right? We really have this culture of, well, my bishop said, or well, my state (laughs) president counseled me or the brethren. I'm so triggered by that phrase, the brethren. I just, I have a really wonderfully feminist mother who would occasionally whisper under her breath, what about the cistern? <laughs> and oh, it used to so just good. it used to just set my father off, but he would also chuckle on occasion because he loves my mother and for all of her feminist <laughs> leanings, like but I mean that's the environment I was raised in, right? Like my Orthodox father, who would never, ever disagree with or speak ill of the brethren. And then there's my mother, like cracking, you know. Cracking jokes about the orthodoxy. I'm so. still dying. The cistern. That is so yeah. good. What about the cistern? So yeah, so back to the student. She had also complained that uh, my use of art was inappropriate and upsetting because I love art. And so in one of my uh, Old Testament classes, I was pulling up various um, depictions of biblical stories. Okay. And a lot of that has nudity. A lot of that has violence. It doesn't look like what you're going to see in the illustrative version of the scriptures. You didn't grab the ones from the Renaissance when they put fig leaves over all the penises? Well, hey, there were actually a few of those and they were upsetting to her as well. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I think it's <laughs> I because said it I. Facetiously, so I'm no, sorry. <laughs> I actually, well, I probably took it too far and I pointed out why some paintings, when you do see the penis, it's smaller and why there's no pubic hair and what these <laughs> symbolize. And I think I just freaked her out, right? But yeah, no, I think most of them did have a fig leaf. So I thought I was safe, right? Yeah. But she was very upset. And also, why did I use non-LDS depictions of Adam and Eve? And then this was the kicker. And I just kind of died inside, but I laughed. She said, why not use pictures of the brethren and their wives when you are assuming what Adam and Eve look like? And I'm like, oh, man. Because you would have had to use a black person (laughs) for it to be accurate. Oh, my goodness. Right. Like, and we've got like two. So. Right. So uh, I just, I just, I realized then and that she said she didn't know if her testimony could survive my class. And I realized she's got bigger problems than me. Like, I am not the problem here. But it was sad. It was sad, too, because I thought, oh, there's so much richness there. And you are so scared. Yes. You're so scared. The purity culture, one of the sad, the sad extensions of that is, is Mormons 
cannot look at some of this beautiful artwork yeah. without immediately bringing to mind sexuality when that was yes. not the point at all. Many right. of these, now it was for some instances, instances but sure. it's just really sad because they can't look past the nudity when there's so much more to the art than just a naked person. Yeah. Agreed. And you know, she obviously hadn't taken world safe yet because (laughs) those textbooks are full of it. So anyway, um, so again, I had, I was very fortunate to, for the most part, get along well with my students because I was at times their peer. It was challenging and I had to learn to kind of stand my ground and not get overly friendly but also that's who I am. I mean, I'm a pretty down to earth person. I didn't want to hold any airs, but I did, you know, have qualifications that allowed me to be their instructor. And I oftentimes would have uh, nothing major, but some little, like my, my mom refers to them as psychological chest bumps, like with young return missionaries, men specifically who kind of, because, you know, for two years, they'd been explaining everything away to people. And so when I would present maybe a different perspective or an idea of what about, you know, this or that, that they were uncomfortable with, they had never been challenged before by a woman specifically. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was always, I felt that energy. I felt that tension. Sometimes when I would drive down into faculty parking, uh, before they even saw my ID card, they'd say, oh, students need to turn around and use the other entry. <laughs> and it's happened on more than one occasion. And I just oh, laugh man. and say, oh, I'm faculty. And they'd kind of frown and take my card. And they're like, oh, <laughs> all right, there you go. So that was fun. Yeah. I was hoping to find some funny reviews of you. So I, I actually dug into a bunch of the Rate My Professor sites and I read a bunch of them. <gasps> I have some really bad ones on those. Oh, no. <laughs> I was hoping to find something super funny because I thought it would be hilarious to read it. No, and laugh for about some it. reason, rate my professor. My worst ones are on there. But you had an overall decent score, and almost all of the written ones were like really good reviews of you. But none sure. of like none of them were really funny. It was it was mostly just people talking about your class. Yeah, there a lot of them are like spiritual. Yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's really funny. Feel free to share the bad ones. I've received a few that really like stab me in my heart. Oh no. But I also, well, it's okay. Like that's life, right? Like you have to learn to take the punches. But I remember thinking, it's kind of funny that you went on Rate My Professor, but you obviously didn't fill out the BYU one because it never came through on the actual official portal. (laughs) And then I was annoyed because I thought, great, this is what the world is going to see, but they're never going to see all my other really good ones. (laughs) Yeah, that is too funny. Uh, It's fine. And just the arrogance of some of these kids. I'm like, oh, gee, Wizzle. Yeah. yeah. But so I I will say I had a wonderful time um, in those five years. I loved my students. I loved the classroom. I loved the learning process. And so to me, being able to guide conversations on these subjects was sacred. And I view all education as sacred. And so obviously received a lot of fulfillment. It was challenging juggling our children. Um, But because I was only part-time. By the time you ended in 2020, Mm -hmm. you had three kids already or? Yeah. Okay. In the space of about five years, you had a couple more kids. And so the, by the time you ended your tenure, you were a mother with multiple children yep. working. And, <laughs> yep. They were in school and I was juggling sports and schedules. And, you know, I could not have done it had I not had a woman that I relied on and trusted who was like our nanny at that time. Yeah. Um, and so I realized how many influential women were involved in my journey. Um and how important that is for women to help women, um, which I am so grateful for. Um, but yeah, so again, great experiences in the classroom. I taught during a very unique time where there were several, I don't know if you call them rumbles or little shakeups or earthquakes <laughs> through church culture that created some really interesting dialogue in the classroom. Well, you started at the tail end of when all of the gospel topics essays are being released. and yep. then a couple of other big things and I'll, I'll let you uh, go into your story. Sure. Yeah. So again, the courses we're teaching were in response to the need to discuss this history, some of these policy changes and problems and try and do it through a a faithful lens. Um, 
And while that's happening, we also have the uh, establishment and then the reversal of the policy of not allowing uh, children of gay couples to be baptized. So you were in the thick of it teaching these kids while that's I going was. on. Yes. Yes. And, you know, it's so funny how we just assume that, I don't know, I mean, I guess we forget how many people or we choose not to see how many people are actually affected by these things. Yeah. Um, and I had so many tears in my classroom and amongst my family because of this policy and the frustration and pain. And then with the reversal, just bewilderment, right? Like spiritual whiplash. Mm. Um, and, and so that, you know, so then we're talking about fallibility and policy versus doctrine and inspiration. And what does all of this even mean? Yeah. Um, in addition, there was a major change to temple wording in regards to women and the covenants they make in the temple. That was huge. Yeah. And, and a progressive move in the right direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. But for someone like me, who's a deep thinker, problematic uh, because words matter. And I had been taught that these things are worded very specifically for a reason. And now someone's telling me, well, it's still kind of all the same thing. <laughs> well, does it matter or doesn't it? Right? Yeah. When you look at it literally, which is the way we're instructed to look at it. It is. Yes. You make a subtle change like that. The relationship is depicted almost linear. It's it's God, Jesus, the husband, yes. then the wife. Yes. But suddenly... It's no longer a line. It's a triangle. Yeah. So suddenly that relationship is different where it's it's Jesus or God at the top point of the triangle and then husband, wife on either lower points of the triangle. So suddenly that relationship is different. Among those people that were liberal enough to talk to me about it, right? Because then you have like, oh, but you can't talk about it unless you're in the temple. Of course. Um, which was very frustrating. So you're, you're not sure. You're tiptoeing around who can I talk to about this? And it, there was kind of this gaslighting that I saw going on in by official persons that were trying to control the narrative of like, well, again, it's, it's really no different. And thing, it's like, no, no, it is different. <laughs> and this has impacted my grandmothers and my mother in the way that they view their, their covenants to their husband, their relation to God, their responsibilities. And then you have this generation of young, somewhat naive Mormon girls getting their endowments out. So now women and never knowing that it was different and kind of poo pooing these people that are saying we struggle with misogyny in the church. And they're saying, no, we don't, you don't understand. It's I'm I've been through the temple. Things aren't like that. And I'm just like, Oh man. Well, you and I went through a similar experience because we went through the temple after all of the penalties were removed. You and I, we got the vestiges of them, just the hand symbols of the penalties, but we were never instructed on right. what they were. So if you don't know, right, that that history existed, you'd never know. Yeah. They're just weird hand signs. And, <laughs> and I, I remember sitting and thinking, it's like, these have to have some sort of meaning. Oh, that's good on you, though. And I'm like trying to think about it. Good I, on you <laughs> for just, even recognizing that. <laughs> I always overthink everything in my life. So I... I I would sit there and I would ponder and I just could not come up with anything. Well, and we're there in the temple. And then when you do have the questions, they won't tell you because we don't know. (laughs) (laughs) So good luck, right? Uh, So yeah, again, I'm trying to be progressive. M. Russell Ballard had given a 2016 CES address to all of the CES employees, seminaries and institutes and BYU religious education saying, know the gospel topic essays like the back of your hand. So I'm feeling like I have this apostolic uh, duty, right? Given this apostolic task given to me to, to just utilize them and yeah. interject them in my lessons. And So here you are, you're in the ancient scripture department and there's a gospel topics essay about the book of Abraham. How do you handle that? And how do the other professors there handle that it is clearly a fabrication of one way or another, whether it's an inspired fabrication or whether it was him writing it himself, whatever is happening there, it's not a literal translation. Sure. Sure. To say inspired fabrication, right? That's dangerous because it's like, well, but then you still got the fabricated part. So I'll tell you how I handled it. I was upset when I 
was, again, there was a lot of gaslighting, like, well, those who are in the know have known this for a long time. <laughs> and we've never claimed this is the, this was the apologetic response. We've never claimed that the facsimiles in your Pearl of Great Price are the actual documents that you're reading as translation. That was the apologetic answer, right? Like these were some that Joseph had, but we don't actually know if these were the ones he's referring to in the book of Abraham. Like, goodness gracious. That's why they have them in the Pearl of Great Price, because you're looking at them going, oh, wow. And here's the translation, right? So come <laughs> on. I mean, to me, it's like the, the, the psychological gymnastics, theological gymnastics people do to just create these loopholes as if to say, see, we were, we're not dishonest. We're not trying to fool anyone. And one of the things that really upset me when I um, was starting to kind of start to listen to like Mormon stories uh, and various other podcasts to just open myself up to others' experiences is to realize that David Bakaboy, 10 years before me, who was trying to go full-time at uh, BYU, had a PhD in Hebrew Bible, had suggested this catalyst theory that perhaps the Book of Abraham is a, um, like you said, a revealed document that was inspired by these facsimiles, but it's not a direct translation. And he got shot down, slapped yeah. on the wrist for being too liberal in his approach, and that that wasn't a faith promoting approach. And then 10 years later, Carrie Mielstein, who's currently still in the department, mm -hmm. uh, Egyptologist, is teaching this catalyst theory. And everyone's applauding it going, oh, what a brilliant way to look <laughs> at it. But David Bakavoy was too progressive for his time. And that was only a period of 10 years. And I, it didn't sit right with me. It made me really uncomfortable. And on my mission, I realized that too, that, you know, depending on who's in charge at the time, you either can or can't share certain aspects of history and you can share them openly or you can't. Yeah. But it's controlled by someone in power. Yeah. So that, that was upsetting for me, but I embraced the catalyst theory. It made sense to me. Yeah. And I was willing to, I, I, to this day, I'm willing to look at the book of Mormon. I mean, to me, it's the only thing that makes sense, right? Like <laughs> whether or not you say it's for good or for bad to me, it is clear that Joseph very much had the capacity to write that book. Oh yeah. And he did. Um, do I think he did it with malicious intent? That's another podcast. I actually don't. <laughs> did he end up doing some horrible things? Absolutely. Um, give a man some power, right? Look what happens. Of course. Yeah. He wrote that himself <laughs> or, you know, or God I, revealed that to him. <laughs> yeah. However you want to look at it, but to see, there's a side to me that makes some people uncomfortable. I'm, I'm kind of a mystic. I embrace that. Like okay. people do incredible things when they feel that they're being inspired by God for good and for bad, incredible on both sides, right? There are examples of this all throughout history yes. of people feeling like they're inspired from one deity or another yes. and doing incredible feats that yes. are well attested. Yes. And that, you know, having that knowledge of world religious experiences throughout history, really, it was another thing on my shelf because I started to realize as incredible as this story however you want to look at it is mormonism we are not unique to the miraculous things that occurred yeah other traditions have their miraculous other traditions have their angelic visitations other traditions have uh their faith promoting stories of martyrdom and uh persecution and it just really kind of humbles you and opens your mind to different perspectives yeah right? well, so it, i yeah well, anyway. this was something that i grappled with for a long time as well and the fact that christianity only makes up about 30 percent of the population of the planet like i could not reconcile that god at being a loving being would only give his truth to 30 percent of the people i at the time i believed that the truth was just mormonism but sure. i could not reckon reconcile that even even that other 30 percent that only had part like how could god not reveal more to everyone. Mm. And so I had yes. in my mind yes. decided that he inspired and this was this was one of the early nuanced belief nuanced beliefs that I held it. I decided that he inspired 
every single culture Mm -hmm. and that his hand was everywhere. Sure. Which I think is a very generous uh, response to what you had felt is the love of God in your own life. Yeah. And you're trying to see how, how is that love of God the same then for, for all my brothers and sisters, because surely it has to be bigger, right? Of course. If you say God is loving and then box him in to just yeah. one people, well, that's not loving. I mean, in the previous podcast, we were talking about some of the challenges with reading the Old Testament narrative through a literal lens. <laughs> this is one of my problems with the Old Testament, too. Ugh, it's like you want to you want to traumatize someone. Let's read those narratives where God is <laughs> celebrating and commanding the children of Israel to bash children against stones, right? To massacre. And take little girls to be their wives. And- yes, to rape, to pill. And I remember my mom being so upset with my dad's very literalist perspective on this. And my dad's perspective was, if God commands it, it's right. Yeah. And somehow this is all for the greater good. Now, and again, uh. this isn't just a conservative Mormon perspective. This is a Christian perspective. That many churches still have. Like, who are we to say? If God commands it, you do it. Yeah. That concept right there, if God can command anything and it's right, means that morality has no value in itself. Yeah. Well, and the huge problem that is created that allows for abuse of that idea. Yes. It just, and having seen it, having seen that happen and how many times you know, do we see these horrible stories pop up in the news about bishops or state presidents or mission presidents who abuse their power based on that principle? Because somehow they hold some priesthood authority and people choose to believe them. Yeah. Oh, Scott, go on forever about that. So let's jump back. So here you <laughs> hey, are. You're a woman. Hey. You're nuanced. Before we get into maybe the decline of your of your relationship with the the department, but do you feel like I don't want you to say something negative if there's nothing negative to say, but sure. were, were you treated any differently as a woman teaching in the religious department than your male peers for good or ill? It's tricky. I definitely felt this. Um, and whether it's because I was internalizing it or I was self projecting, it's hard to say, but amongst the older generation and by older, I'm saying, 50 and above, okay. which there are plenty in the department. I definitely felt this heavy dose of like benevolent patriarchy, kind of like they immediately saw me as someone that they had stewardship over um, to kind of guide me along because, I mean, they had all had priesthood positions where that's what they did, right? Yeah. Um, and I don't think there was any ill intention with it necessarily, at least from what I received, but I definitely, I had written down on some notes that I remember. I mean, I intentionally did not try to conform, right? Because I wanted to make a statement that I'm here, I'm different, and I'm going to be who I am. And so I would intentionally always go to faculty meetings, either in slacks or, or, you know, women can get away with jeans in ways that men can't if they're dressed jeans. Does that make sense? Yeah. I remember my dad talking about um, just dynamics between his female coworkers and himself. And it just blew my mind because being up at the University of Utah before I worked for BYU, you know, if you wanted to go to lunch with a colleague, you went. If you needed to have a business meeting with a colleague and it was a man, no problem. And it blew my dad's mind. And he talked about how inappropriate that would be amongst his CES colleagues or in the church office building and you did not do it. You never shut your door with a woman. I mean, they're taking these same ecclesiastical structures, which some of them are necessary and good, but they're applying it in the workplace in a way that just comes off as patriarchal and awkward. Um, And that he would never. And so, and so here's what happens. You naturally have this formation of the old boys club because we're not going to go to lunch with our sister colleagues because that'd be awkward. We're married men. We can't have a professional relationship because you're trained to think it's impossible. And so the men kind of have this club and the women are naturally excluded because of the whole 
uh, gender dynamics and the, the strictness on chastity and virtue, which to me is embarrassing. Like to think that a professional academics can't go to lunch with each other because it would be deemed inappropriate. <laughs> I just, I really pushed against that, but you know, I, uh, at the same time, wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna invite my male colleague to lunch because it'd make them horribly uncomfortable. Um, but it was, it was so embarrassing to me. Yeah. This illustrates one of the problems of the patriarchy where it affects yes. men negatively, where yeah. typically we talk about misogyny as, as only affecting women. But here, you cannot build a friendship with a male yes. colleague because of patriarchy and because yeah. of the way the yeah. system is set up. And that's yeah. so sad because I regularly will sit down with female coworkers, have lunch, mm -hmm. chat, mm -hmm. build friendships. It's casual. It's friendly. You know, we'll yeah. have business discussions. It's a very normal thing. Yes. And I think you hit on a really important point that has not been discussed as of yet much amongst more liberal circles is patriarchy hurts men. Like this isn't a men against women thing. It's a structural problem. Yes. And it hurts men in so many ways, including these psychologically and developmentally sensitive areas that that really hinder just natural interaction. So yeah. yeah, I felt that. I definitely felt that. Like and and the subjects that were being discussed, you know, it was like, oh, but a woman's here. So we're not, you know, if you're talking about chastity, if we're talking like we can say the word masturbation. <laughs> we're gonna say the word vagina or penis or penetration. Like and I actually made a point to use that kind of language in my classroom if and when it was appropriate. Because I didn't want to tiptoe around these very real issues, you know, um, because I remember how uncomfortable I used to feel when people would do that to me. And uh, anyway, I yeah. just recorded an episode. It'll probably air before I post this one, but I, I recorded an episode recently where I talk about penetration and how, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, in, there in, I am giggling at that word. See, I'm still, I'm still <laughs> deconstructing my it's issues. It's still funny. No, but I'm talking about, I'm talking about, same-sex relations in the ancient world and what Paul specifically would have oh, been talking man. about in his Great. verses Good stuff. And, yes. and how penetration was very important and how homosexuality, the way we look at it today, mm -hmm. did not exist it in the ancient exist. world. And yeah. so it, as you're saying this, uh, these words that we deem as inappropriate or not able to say, if we could not say them, how could we articulate the points that are important about these subjects? Uh, great point. Yeah. And that's another thing I'm hoping, but I, I don't, I, I, I'm, I have false hope. Let's put it that way. That some <laughs> BYU academic would pick this up and run with it to help advance our theology a little bit. I don't yeah. know if you've read Blair Osler's queer Mormon theology, but she does a great job of introducing what could be possibilities. Yeah. And uh, I mean, these are things I've thought of for years. And so I'm grateful that she is a queer Mormon woman was able to take that first step and say, let's open our mind a little bit um, and look at our own history and be honest about it and see what's useful there. And how can we build from that? Um, so anyway, yeah, being a woman again. And one thing I have to say is it also, there was a downside to it because, and by downside, I mean, as I've deconstructed, I've realized I perhaps allowed myself to stay or to, put up with things that uh, ethically seemed wrong with me or doctrinally I was really uncomfortable with. And there was a lot of ego there, meaning I loved the surprise and the, oh, wow, that I would get from people when they asked, do you work? What do you do? Yeah. How cool was it for me to say, yeah, I actually, I'm part-time in ancient scripture and they're like, oh, do you just, do you just teach online or at night? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm faculty. Like, I'm teaching during the day. This is what I do. And I learned to love that response because who doesn't love to be seen? Of course. And having grown up, um, not quite feeling comfortable in my own skin as a woman, always feeling like I was making men uncomfortable because of my body or just doing something wrong for even existing. Does that make sense, Scott? Like, oh yeah. And and always kind of having, you know, I mentioned scrupulosity and yeah, the burden of male sexuality is put on women. Oh, in and Mormonism. I felt that I felt that frequently. It. I have some horror stories from my mission. Oh man, <laughs> about that as well. It just as I internalized that kind of energy, 
um, and what was and wasn't appropriate behavior as a woman. And uh, so to suddenly feel like I was doing something right, that my family could celebrate, specifically my father, right? Because there are a lot of interesting dynamics in the Mormon family in relation to father and daughter. Yeah. And so I felt like I was finally doing everything right for my religion, for my family, uh, for my community. And yes, most women shouldn't work outside of the home, but I somehow got a pass because I was working for the church. So you can see how this really false ego. Just, yeah. Well, you were special. You were different. You were the exception. Yeah. Yep. And I, I realize now how dangerous that was. Yeah. Um, because it kind of kept me hanging on maybe longer than I should have. And it was harder for me to let it go because it's painful to let go of your ego, you know? So what led to the end of this employment at CES? Okay. Yeah. Let's get into that. So it's really important that I point out um, that it was in fact organic and it had more to do with my home ward and my bishop than it did my department. Um, And so I'll just briefly go over that. It's on my blog. If anyone's interested. Yes. Her blog is fantastic. Yeah. We can link to that specific. Okay. I'll post a link on the episode description to that. one. Yeah. So people can find that specific one where I just spilled it all. Um, But in summary, what had happened is I was now teaching gospel doctrine in our ward. And, you know, I I realized that you can't teach gospel doctrine the same way you're going to teach a BYU religion class. But it's to me at the same time, I'm who I am in all settings. And so I was obviously a certain kind of teacher, which some people loved and some people hated. Um, But I was speaking about in reference to the Book of Mormon and that beloved scripture that all are like unto God, male and female, black and white, bonded free. And I brought up the point that I was encouraged that the church is taking baby steps towards acknowledging its racist history. And then I brought up some situations that had happened with my own immediate family. But I feel that I'm a competent enough teacher to not let that overshadow the point of my lesson. Does that make sense? So Mm -hmm. it was real quick. I just hit on it real fast. Um, And I said, and to me, I'm thinking, see, this is good. This is showing in in conjunction with the essays that we're making, we're at least doing something, right? Rose colored glasses. (laughs) It's moving in the right direction. It's baby steps, but moving there. I should have realized by me saying the church's racist history that I was going to make some people very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and what happened was immediately the first counselor and our bishop Rick raised his hand after I finished, you know, making my point. And he said, and I'm I'm teaching, okay? And he says to my face in front of the whole class, I get really frustrated. No, he said annoyed. Let me clarify. He said, I get really annoyed with people that don't know how to distinguish what's been taught from the pulpit and church culture. So when you say the church has racist history, I'm not okay with that. And what am I supposed to say, Scott? Like, he's a Bishop Rick member. And here I am trying to follow what the manual says in Come Follow Me that we're supposed to reference the gospel topics essays. I'm trying, you know, I'm also, again, an academic. This is my field. This is what I do. And I I just got quiet. And I said, "I, I appreciate your comment. I need to clarify I do not think the church is racist today. I think that we have problems and currents of racism that are rooted in the church's racist history. And he shook his head and he said, again, you, the, the, the brethren are not, you know, so you can imagine where it went. Of course. There was this awkward back and forth. And I, I brought up the essay on race and the priesthood. And I said, I want to, I said, I appreciate what you're saying, but I feel the need to, do as it as an instructor, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, and professionally, this is my field. And so, of course, then obviously we're both uncomfortable because he's putting me against the wall, and I'm challenging his authority. And I said, "Have you as a read- woman challenging yeah, right? his authority? He's in the bishopric." Yep. And so I said, "Have you read the 2013 essay on race and the priesthood?" And he shook his head and said, "No." And then I said, "Do you know what it is?" And he said. No. And I said quickly what that document was. And I said, this is a formal statement made by the church that explicitly says we disavow 
any past or current racist doctrines or teachings that have ever been supported by the church. And I quoted straight out of the text and he got really uncomfortable and then walked out of my class. And I just looked to the class and I said, I'm sorry, things got tense. This is a reflection of how we still have a lot of work to do. When we deal with uncomfortable parts of our history, I encourage you all to look up the gospel topics essays and read them, read them, be familiar with them. I am not. That's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But in my mind, I'm like, but this is what the brethren have asked us to do. Right. So it was awkward. I got a few follow-up emails. I contacted the Sunday school presidency said, Hey, I know this was awkward. Do we need to meet with the bishopric to clear some things up? I'm still kind of hot over this. Well, because you need their endorsement for your employment. That's what happened. So that was probably in February of 2020. That kind of began an informal inquiry where the bishopric started to meet together and go through my blogs, listen to my various podcasts. (laughs) because <laughs> you've been on you've been on podcasts for a number of years now I, yep. I looked up and i found you on a number of different formats having yeah. conversations similar to this one yep and i always at that time you know i was a little more reserved because i was trying to stay within the bounds that byu had asked me to and i respected that um so i wasn't afraid but i was trying to be who i was in all circumstances and not you know play games And I guess people were printing off some of my material or articles or blogs and bringing it into the bishopric. But what is frustrating to me is I had asked twice, do we need to meet? Is there a problem? Is there anything to discuss? And I was told that there wasn't. And it was April 28th. So the semester started the next, that was a Friday. The semester started a Monday and I found out that I had been terminated. Bam. I got a call from the vice president of faculty relations. I had no idea, Scott. Like, I did not know this was happening. I didn't know there were issues. So you're like walking to your class or like, what's the time frame on this? This is incredible. I'm blown away. That was Friday. Yeah, that was a Friday. And I was starting the, is it the spring term? I was starting spring term that Monday. So I get a call on Friday. And at first it was very like, we're so sorry. This is the worst part of our job, but I am calling to inform you that you have officially been terminated from your position. And I'm like, like, it was weird. It was like surreal. I'm like, oh, well something, there's a mistake, right? Like, that's so crazy. I kind of laughed. And then I said, can you wait, what, what has happened? And he said, you know, I, I don't have details, but I can tell you that your bishop has denied your ecclesiastical endorsement. and." you have been terminated from all employment contracts here, <sighs> here out. So I was already lined up for spring and summer and fall. Yeah. And I said, they, they do those contracts annually, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, usually about a semester, two semesters in advance. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I was lined up to go for like the next nine months. And I said, does my department know? And they're like, well, we haven't contacted them yet, uh, but we will shortly. I said, so my, my department has no idea that I'm being terminated. <laughs> and they're like this. And then they kind of push. And back. you have classes scheduled. I'm sure there were students that went in that did not have a teacher. I had already been in discussion with all my students, sent them the syllabi. And so my heart was breaking and then I'm starting to panic. Like what happened? And they kind of stonewalled and said, this is a situation between you and your bishop and you need to refer to him. And I said, well, is there any petition process? Can I, I don't know what has happened, but I'm sure there was a mistake, but if not, is there any way for me to advocate for myself here? This is clear ecclesiastical abuse and retaliation. Oh, it was horrible. It was horrible. And I, and I'm not exaggerating in anything that I tell you, like I have documentation for this whole mess. And they said, we do not dictate how a bishop comes to their conclusion of worthiness, and it's not our place to do so. So basically, your bishop decides you're not worthy to work for BYU, and you go work it out with him. Wow. There's no safety mechanism. So I'm shaking by that point. My husband comes upstairs. I start sobbing because I realize this has got to be 
this has got to be in relation to what happened. And see, after that lesson. Because it was only COVID, like two months prior or three months prior. It was two months. Yeah. And then COVID hit and church was canceled. So you hadn't seen him in a while. I hadn't seen him. And here's the irony. He's a new bishop, very conservative. Scott, he had never met with me once for ecclesiastical or personal reasons. He didn't know me like at all. And so I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. But he prayed and he received revelation about it, I'm sure. Oh, I'm furious. <laughs> okay? Sorry, so I, no, it gets I say uglier. That facetiously, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. I mean, trust me, I've went through all the phases of shock and anger and rage. And so uh, I mean, I don't I don't want to get too into this, but basically I'm such a mess, but the feminist me wants to handle it, right? Like yeah. I can handle it. I'll go talk to him. And my husband's like, no, I'm going to talk to him. And I was like, <laughs> no, you can't. I can handle my own business. You know, I'm thinking I've got to deal with this. And he's like, hon, you're a mess. Let me just go see what's going on. You call your department. So we kind of divided and conquered. I got on the phone with my department. He went to the bishop's place of employment. And, you know, my husband is the stereotypical, big, scary Polynesian. (laughs) And so he, I'm sure, took advantage of that, that he walks in there with his hat on backwards and he's 6'3 and he's got Got his hoodie on. mask on. on. Yeah, yeah, right? His COVID (laughs) mask. He doesn't ask for Bishop so-and-so. He asked for him by name. And the front desk person was just like, uh, like, like call security, like what? <laughs> and it, he, so the bishop comes out and he's so like, this oh. is foreign to me. Hold a quick side note. So even, even at his place of business, people call him Bishop. Everyone knows it's his, it's his personal, he's self-employed. So you, don't, you don't have to, we, we don't have to dox yeah. him or say his employment, no, but I'm just like, no, it's okay. so yeah. I'm, I'm outside the bubble. Like when I see people <laughs> in their place of employment from the church, you don't call them a bishop or like when you're talking with their secretary, that just is like, it's sorry, weird. It caught me off guard a little no, bit. No, <laughs> I get it. I get it. But yeah, again, it's a, it's his own company. Okay. And so people know him through anyway. Yeah. Okay. So he comes around the corner and before they get back to his office, he says in front of the office there, the lobby, do you want to tell me why my wife got a phone call this morning and she's been fired from BYU? <laughs> and he just said you could hear a pin drop. And I hearing this, I am like applauding my husband because yes. by that time I'm just mad. I'm just mad. Like, you know what? You deserve to be shooken up a little of bit. Of course. Because my whole life, like, I mean, every like I was I was imploding. Like I, I didn't even know where to begin fixing this. So to make a long story short, my department didn't know. I called them. They're at a loss. They said, we don't know why this has happened. We didn't approve it. It was never run by us. And we're willing to back you. Let us know what we need to do. Do we need to write letters? Do we need to? And I said, well, let me call my bishop. I'll get back to you. They're like, okay, great. We're on standby. We're so sorry. But yeah, you're not in our system anymore. So it had nothing to do with my department. Nothing. Wow. So in between two, two and a half hour personal meetings with the bishop where there was lots of tears some rage. Uh, it all came out that he, and he used this phrase, I was concerned that you are a wolf in sheep's clothing. I have been following your discussions and your tone is not faithful. And I feel like you egg people on and then leave them hanging and you don't provide them with a faithful answer. And I just looked at him and I said, sometimes there are not faithful answers. What do you want me to do, Bishop? Like, but see, that's you being painfully honest about the situation. And the church needs to get there. And I think we'll get there eventually. But you're presenting the facts and you're presenting a real world view of how yeah. the church needs to face everything. And I wasn't afraid to talk about it publicly. And I think that's what made him very uncomfortable. He had lost, uh, lost. a family member had left the church due to these kind of, okay, you know, unpleasant facts. And for him, he felt like that wasn't the place to discuss them, but that's subjective. And so, and then he said to me on one of these discussions, you need to know that it's not just me or members of the ward that are concerned. BYU is also concerned. And I I wasn't having it. And I said, who at BYU is concerned? He's like, well, I've been in discussion with certain people. I said, you tell me who, and he named a name. And I said, that person is an HR They are not part of my department, nor are they academically trained to make a judgment on my conclusions. 
I was furious. And I, and you could tell he didn't think I was going to push back. Um, and I said, so you may think that you were in the right because you and this guy decided to comb through my blogs. I said, if you want to sit down with my department, let's do it. Let's have a meeting and print out everything I've ever written. And we will sit down and see if they're uncomfortable with these. Let's things. learn about the documentary hypothesis. Let's learn <laughs> about church history. <laughs> I just, I just would, I just was like, are you kidding me? So again, the patriarchy, right? Some guy in HR who probably loved his job uh, thinking I'm going to protect the youth of Zion against this feminist liberal, right? Yeah, It's a witch hunt. And I, I, again, had a great relationship with my department and I wasn't afraid of them. So I was like, do it. Let's meet. Right. Well, that never happened. And we got the stake involved. And I, one of my biggest issues was, okay, I'm furious, but I also feel bad for the bishop because he's not trained. He's not trained to know how to handle this. He didn't know me. He made an error in judgment. But at the same time, the policy is poor. Why is there no chance to double check with me? Why was he never asked if he discussed this with me? We set him up for failure as a system, right? So I made that point. Regardless, like even even if he were to decide after meeting with you that he didn't feel like you should get your endorsement, like at least he needed to have a conversation with you prior to you getting blindsided by this. Well, so I threw the scriptures in their face and I said, this isn't doctrinal. Like this isn't how, this isn't how the Bible comes to a judgment, right? Like you don't do it this way. And I, my whole life I had kind of been, I realized that I had been naive and I just assumed if you work in councils, the system worked. And this was the first time that I really got slapped, you know, because, well, guess what? There, there were councils, but I wasn't included. And no one saw anything wrong with that to call it out. BYU had just come up with a new HR policy that if you were terminated for whatever reason, you had to go back through the rehire process. And my department went to bat for me and asked, look, this was a mistake. We disagree. And the bishop, after mediation and a lot of come to Jesus moments for both of us, um, because that really hurt the whole wolf in sheep's clothing thing. Like this was my life's work. You know, like I had no greater love than ministering through the scriptures to this group of students who had been entrusted to me. And so to have someone use that phrase with me, he also said, I've been trained in various psychological theories and you exhibit what I would call uh, tactics of a predator. And that broke me because there's sexual abuse in my family. And I'm like, how? dare you and my husband like patted my leg <laughs> while I because I was just I was just ready to to let him have it um like that that was so hurtful to me but what I've since realized is he was coming from a place of fear because he's terrified of the history he's terrified of the problems the church is facing so he's trying to double down and while I feel like it's my job to navigate these discussions and include everyone in the dialogue he said, it's also my job as bishop to protect the minds of my congregants. Well, what do you do? Right? Like what, what, what to do? But I'll tell you what, we're not going to come to any understanding, like you said, if we don't hold a council where we're all together having this discussion. Um, so I approached my stake and I said, what I think needs to happen is you need to, as a stake, institute some kind of training for your bishoprics on how to handle BYU ecclesiastical endorsements. If there's ever a question, there needs to be some kind of a, a check and balance policy. And the bishopric needs to be trained on the Come Follow Me manual. I was also told once it was clear that I didn't pull this essay out of some anti-Mormon thing, like this was a church document, you don't have the authority to use that in a Sunday school class. That's crazy. So once again, I had to open up the come follow me manual and show them that this is on the approved list of outside sources that they encourage us to use. So twice I basically like kicked their pride, you know, and I didn't want to do it, but they were coming at me with false accusations and power that was not justified. 
And it didn't end well. I mean, we like there was apologies and he, the bishop ended up trying to get help me get my job back. But the damage had been done. And this guy at HR, his little buddy that had been reading my essays and stuff, he wasn't going to bend. He was not going to make a, what's the word? An exception. Thank you. Um, and so I received this letter by both H signed by HR and my department chair at the time. And it was, it was basically one of those like nonsense letters where there's a lot of fluff and we're so grateful for all you've done. However, due to new policy, it's unfortunate, but we can't rehire you. We encourage you to reapply. However, if you choose to reapply, your resume has to go through the HR department. We have no control over whether or not we see it. And if and when we receive your resume, you will be competing for these positions with the new wave of applicants. And it broke me. That's brutal. Like like something inside of me broke. Because here you've put five years into this. Yeah. And it doesn't even matter at this point. Well, and it again, it just kind of showed me how quickly, due to the hierarchical structure of authority and power, that someone with this power, with these keys, can just change someone's life forever based on an assumption. But I'm grateful. So here we go. I think we probably talked about that way too long. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Here we are. We're a year and some change removed from all of this. Yeah. Where are you spiritually now? You mentioned briefly that you identify as a mystic. Well, I incorporate mystic ideas. Let's put it that way. Okay. Like I, I embrace mystic pers- perspectives on certain religious phenomena. So. so do you attend the LDS church? No, I don't. I have not. I've gone back twice, I think. Uh, one in support of a family member and once in support of a gal who was one of my young women and she was serving a mission. So I went to her farewell. Um, so, yeah, we can talk about that. So once I came, it took me a while to, you know, everyone with still kind of an optimistic perspective on this was saying, this is a divine mess. You can turn this around and it will be one of your power stories because you will have been humble and everyone will have learned their lesson and you're going to come out stronger. It just didn't sit with me. And I remember one Sunday, because I wasn't going to church and it was still COVID, I went hiking and I was up in the mountains and I just, you know, where you just have to, because you don't want to feel the emotions you're feeling, you just keep pushing yourself physically. Yeah. So I'm like hiking going higher, going higher. And I finally just sat down and let myself catch my breath. And I just started weeping. Um, Finally let yourself feel it. Yep. I just sat there and, you know, took comfort in the trees and this little stream. And I realized I don't want to go back. I need to move forward. And I know it's going to disappoint people, but I feel like there's something more for me out there. And I don't, I can't, Go back out of fear, fear that there's nothing else, fear that I'm making the wrong decision, fear that people will judge me for not trying hard enough. That's not a reason to go back. And because of all of these shelf items I've been having, in addition to the difficulty trying to navigate these things in the classroom, I was coming to a place anyway where I didn't feel that I could morally stand there as a representative of the church. And teach these young adults because as much as it was wonderful feeding them the doctrines of grace, I also realized they looked to me and said, well, Kaisa can make it work. So somehow I should too. And I would never want someone to assume that just because I was making it work that they should. Well, that goes right to the problem that we addressed in the previous episode. They're they're putting off their agency or their ability to think critically and decide yeah. for themselves to someone else. Yeah. Being able to shrug off to put down that burden was a beautiful and like catalytic moment for me mm. because it opened the gateways to deconstruction, which as you know, is so painful and so traumatic. Yes. Um, it led to a lot of my bless my husband's heart. Like, A lot of hours long meditations on our back porch, just looking at the sky and just just trying to be as open minded as possible and communing with at that point, 
whoever God is, if he, she, they even are, what does that mean? Like, what do I feel? What do I know? What am I comfortable with? What am I not comfortable with? I mean, you know how it is. Everything, right? I was already feeling relieved. I remember when I wrote my department chair, basically a thank you, but no thank you letter to tell him I wasn't coming back for various reasons. And I, that when I hit that send button, it was, it was painful, but it was also, there was so much relief because I thought I can quit pretending and now I can go to work like on myself because I've got to find some answers before I can continue on this path. If this is the path for me, I had a really unique experience where I, and it's hard to explain. I don't, if people aren't uh, familiar with meditation and like silencing your mind and connecting to the universe is kind of a broad word. And I don't want to like be too out there. I incorporate a meditative practice in my life because I feel like it centers me and yeah. I don't believe in any supreme being. I, I don't know. And I'm comfortable with that, but I, sure. when I have this meditative practice and I feel, I feel something to me, I attribute it to the interconnectedness yes. of all yes. things where I am part of the universe. And I have been since the beginning, you know, for the 13 billion years since it started and in one form or another, one element of matter or another, my essence has existed somehow. Now, now I'm not saying my consciousness, but that, sure. that interconnectedness of just being present and aware of how Everything that's happened prior to this moment has brought me to here and how yes. it's because of all of these moments that I am here. Yes. And I think that's what I was trying to do. So I was out there just trying to connect, like you said, to the reality, you know, and we talked about the word Elohim, right? Uh, this idea of a unified being made up of other, like, like, other other beings essentially we are all and it started it was fascinating how within those like two hours that i was sitting out there the sun was setting and then it got dark it was like my mind opened up to that reality scott like you are part of something so much bigger and like you said whether it's a divine being or just life and the unity of that life the fact that you're a part of it is powerful but it's also refreshing to realize that it's so much bigger than you, that you can get out of your head and realize I have always been, I will always be in one form or another, right? Consciousness is fluid. It was, it was, it was like, and I wasn't on anything, you know, like this was all just <laughs> my brain. And I, again, when I deconstructed, I probably had four or five episodes where I was, I would say somewhat hysterical, like a lot of crying a lot of sobbing. It just came out of me. And this was one of those times, but it was a, it was a more quiet, just release of pain. And I felt this incredible acceptance of, of just me. Like you said, everything up to this point has led me to where I am now. Is it Ram Das who says, be here now, right? Like just be and trust that nothing in life. And I think you can find this message in the scriptures is wasted that every experience, no matter how traumatic can be an opportunity to learn and then bless the lives of others. And there is no such thing as no more chances or it's over. Or again, because we are part of everything, life's going to go on one way or the other. It's bigger than us. And I started allowing myself to, so I walked away from that meditation realizing I need to deconstruct my ego. I have for years allowed myself to say, I'm okay, I'm enough because this is what I do. This is my title. This is my education, right? This is what people see. You were enough because you were a professor, a woman yep. at CES. Yep. yep. And that and suddenly was- you weren't. It was not enough. And I am ashamed to admit that that was part of it, but it's, it's weird how I've been able to give myself grace now because we all do it in one form or another. Every single one of us has that thing we cling on to that is our identity, but it is not who we are. Exactly. And we do it and we compare ourselves against others. And then we feel better because we can say, well, I do this and you don't. How shallow is that? Right? How, how awful. <laughs> and I thought I was a pretty good person. Like, 
I was loving Jesus, you know, and I was, but it is in, now I'm going to start using some, this is where we can talk about different religious ideas and philosophies. I think the, the Sanskrit word Maya, Mm -hmm. right. An illusion that identity was an illusion. It was false. It was temporary and it wasn't feeding my higher self. And it was also forcing me to not have authentic communion with my own soul and come to a better understanding of what I believe, what I think, what I've experienced because I was outsourcing. Right. And I was cloaking. I was hiding my own questions from myself through ego. And so I had to start really acknowledging what, what was good for my life, what wasn't good for my life. Um, and in Hindu mythology, there's that angry tongue hanging out. She's got heads draped around her shoulders and a necklace, the, the dark mother, right? Kali Ma. I've always been fascinated with the Hindu pantheon and the history of it all. But that's one pantheon I haven't studied very thoroughly yet. Well, and there's, how can you? I, I know. Mean, you begin to and you realize, <laughs> oh my. But uh, I have had some unique experiences with some beautiful friends who are Indian and Hindu. And it's just been impressive to me. And for some reason, during this time of deconstruction and pain and deep meditation over the course of that summer, so the summer of 2020, I felt very drawn to study her. Interesting. So my Christian friends that are listening to this are going to be like, oh gosh, heretic, <laughs> right? Like she's gone to the, she's gone to the demons. <laughs> and I'll admit when you look at those depictions of her, she is fierce. She's kind of crazy. She's terrifying and she's ruthless. And, but then when you study the reasons behind her being depicted that way, to me, that incarnation of that kind of energy was what I needed. I needed something bigger than myself to come in and cut out of my life the things that weren't serving me. I needed something bigger than myself and more fierce than myself to end the relationships. So, you know, she's surrounded by this idea of death and she's beheading these, these powers that, that be. Well, that happened in my life. I was severed from things that were my life force. So I thought, right? And then there's the deity Ganesha, right? The, the elephant, that beautiful, happy Ganesh God. And that idea of him moving things out of your life and bringing other things into your life completely just because, because the universe somehow conspires in our favor one way or another to teach us what we need to be taught. And I saw that happening in my life. So I saw destruction and then I began to see new growth in my soul, in my ability to relate to other people. But, you know, I, I always felt that I would be some form of quote unquote Christian if I ever stepped away from Mormonism. And I don't feel that way anymore. Um, I'm definitely in a place where I, I don't want to come across arrogant when I say this, but like I walk with Jesus. But what I mean when I say that is I look to his example because he's like my guru. And that is probably so sacrilegious to people. <laughs> the morality he presented was phenomenal for its time. I mean, yeah. he was so passionate. I mean, at least the stories that we hear about him. <laughs> well, I see, that's the thing, right? So I am able to sit back and say, I don't know about the theological Christology anymore. I don't take, I, I can talk about it and I can make points for and against different perspectives. But I don't argue any specific side because I've studied the scriptures enough to say, we don't know. We can't know. And every single one of those gospels is written from someone different, someone's perspective, and most likely not even the people we attribute the gospels to, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, they came out too late and they're, they borrow yeah. heavily from each there's other. Some, yep, there's some issues, right? And so when we say, what do we know about Jesus? And they're artistic. There are certain artistic and stylistic choices that these authors make that are clearly not historical, but them using yeah. the narrative to make points. Which is very reflective of the what we're talking about, the Old Testament, right? Yes. With this idea of how it was, com we see that happening over and over again to push a political or theological agenda. And it opened my eyes to realize you can find 
these similarities in the text that sit well with you. And so in that way, again, I walk with Jesus. I see him as this revolutionary, gentle rabbi, but one who wasn't afraid to be bold and flip tables when needed. Because, and this is where my mysticism comes in. I don't know if you've studied much with like Richard Rohr. I haven't, no. Okay, so he's this Catholic priest, but he's basically gone mystic. And a lot of people feel that he's an apostate. So I sit well (laughs) with him. I'm in good company with Richard Rohr. But basically he said, you know, the story of Jesus is where we struggle against the powers that be as we try and figure out our own sense of right and wrong. Hmm. We are crucified with Christ when we allow our ego to die. And we are resurrected or born again when we come to understand that we are so much bigger than our ego. But at the same time, we are nothing like the scriptures say, like ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And there's power in that because we realize we're part of something bigger. Um, And so this idea of resurrection or new life in Christ is we are all capable of being Christ, being anointed, being born again, being enlightened. And, you know, for my really sweet, wonderful uh, Indian friends who are Hindu, they find that capacity through Krishna. And my wonderful Muslim friends who have opened my world to so many different perspectives that were not native to my own tradition, they find that through the Quran. And they're, you know, the councils of Muhammad and the Hadiths. And my Buddhist friends find that through the tenets of Buddhism. And not necessarily believing in a God, but believing in a path. And I'll tell you, I'm just open to it all right now. I just feel like I have so much more love in my heart. I don't judge. I can look at things and let me take that back. I do judge. I judge all the time. Um, (laughs) I (laughs) I am trying to catch myself in it and stop myself from doing that. Does that make sense? Um, And one of my favorite guys to read from is that life of this gentleman, Ram Das, who went to India and he basically did the same thing. He deconstructed his ego and he realized the answers are within us. Now that sounds cliche, but he was lucky enough to find a guru who told him just that, like, look, I can teach you everything I know, but it won't be enough. And I remember as a student in graduate school, hoping that I would find someone who I could honestly be like, they get it. They know. They have the answers. Well, I didn't, I didn't find that. What I found was all of the, all the scholars, all of the top of their field type people had their own version of what sat right with them. And I realized that's gotta be me. I've got to stand in my own space and claim it and trust my own lived experience. Um, Again, the unexamined life is not worth living philosophy. Right. And so that's kind of where I'm at. I, drive by we have a a thai buddhist temple here in Leighton. i drive by that place and i ache to go inside i want to sit with them i want to meditate i see my muslim friends when they prostrate themselves during their daily prayer and i find that symbolism beautiful you know even the word islam it means to submit so to me again the mystic universal perspective yeah submit yourself to the fact that you have no control You're part of something bigger and always be open to whatever the universe is going to throw your way. So I see beauty there. I sometimes ache to just go sit with the Relief Society sisters. The last time I did that, it was awkward (laughs) (laughs) and I didn't like it. And I couldn't believe they were saying some of the things they were saying, but I thought these are my people still. I love them. Like, and whenever there's a need in the war that I know about, I'll help out. You know, I want to be part of that community, but I've also realized that there's a part of me that doesn't fit anymore. So I'm definitely in this in-between phase and maybe I'll always be there. I don't know, but I've stopped trying to push myself because I've realized that is a habit I learned in Mormonism. Choose now, choose ye this day whom ye will serve, right? The New Testament narrative of that God likes he doesn't like the lukewarm, right? He spits it out of his mouth. We have that symbolism of there. I were that you were hot or cold, but don't be lukewarm. And so to me, I used to be hard on myself because I was trying to push myself into coming to a conclusion. And then I realized I don't have to do that. Um, Maybe I'll never remove my records for whatever reason. Maybe I'll remove them next week. But when that time comes, I'll know. 
And in the meantime, like, I mean, to use what an overused phrase, I'm going to do me. <laughs> it's so hard, Scott. Like, it is so hard. Ugh. No, but, that, but that's so powerful. When you take the autonomy of your own spirituality and you liberate yourself to be able to look at all walks of life and find the value in a, a wide variety of worldviews, like that, that is so powerful. It, it is so beautiful. And to think, I remember when I was on my mission, I thought it's going to be so nice when I can just have a conversation with someone and not think, okay, how am I going to pitch this to them? Like how, <laughs> where's the gospel pitch going to come in? Like, am I going to give them a book of Mormon? I mean, that was, I lived my life with that kind of anxiety for decades and I don't have to do it anymore. I can, I can meet someone and think, they have something to teach me and I don't necessarily have something to teach them. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. When you mentioned on the mission and, and wondering. Yeah, always trying to teach somebody. <laughs> yes. I, I, used to, I used to envision heaven as like, you know, so excited that everyone's going to have the same beliefs. Everyone's going to be the same. It's yeah, going to be we'll so cool. We'll all understand. Yeah, and we'll all sure. understand. And now I think about that and I'm like, that sounds like hell. Like if, if everyone were exactly the same, like, that is not okay. Like, I do not like this. Amen. And when you start to study, you know, I am not scientifically minded in any way. I just like to read a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. <laughs> and so on a very, yeah, on a very basic <laughs> level, I've done a little like, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, when you do like space time theory. Oh, yeah. Uh, I looked into that a little bit and um, metaphysics and I've realized it can't be that we're all going to be the same because that's not a reflection of the universe. No, right. It's not the diversity around us. And the very fact that uh, opposites attract and create energy, whether it's negative or positive, and we are who we are in relation to the other. I mean, there's so many eternal truths that if we'll just look around us at the, and you know, it's no doubt to me, no surprise that our Western religious traditions have gone so far from fundamental truths that a lot of indigenous cultures still understand because we're detached from the earth. When's the last time we really took our shoes off, stared at the ground, you know, hugged a tree. Like that sounds so silly, but there's something to that. In a, in a recent episode, I, I read a quote from Joseph Campbell, who's one of my favorite professors. Um, his, his theology has greatly influenced the way I see the world, but he has this quote and I'm going to paraphrase, but he says, when you look at religion, literally, all of the meaning leaves it. But when you look at it as mythology and storytelling and truth telling, that's when you find the value in the belief systems. Yes. It, I have taken, you know, the term holy envy. Yes. I have a lot of holy envy for the different sects of Judaism that have been able to do that. Yes. And I look at Mormonism and I think we could do that, guys. If we could own our past, if we could call ourselves out on our stupidity and our pride and our error, imagine what fertile ground we have to work with because there are some things, again, that term useful history. Uh, there was a time when I wanted to write a book about uh, progressive theology and Mormonism and what could, and I still might someday, maybe. Do it. <laughs> but what we have to work with is so much there's so much fertile ground there but to do it just like in our own individual journeys it's the same with an organization we have to first deconstruct and until we're willing to do that as a as a church body with like a a group consensus it's not possible but i do i do have some hope i don't know if it's going to happen in our lifetime but see, we're we're paving the way for future generations to have those conversations and to normalize looking at it in a unique perspective. And yet I'm just horrified that, you know, 15 years ago, I looked at someone like myself and thought, where did you go wrong? Like, I know, right? <laughs> and the whole like universal, you know, perspective that I've kind of embraced and this optimistic, uh, eternal way of looking at things. I used to think, well, that's the easy way out, right? I had no idea what I was missing out on. Well, I'm going to call back to the story from our previous episode. You talked about chatting with this indigenous man from New York and his, his 
worldview that he was trying to express to you then sounds so similar to what you're telling me now. I mean, you almost already had that conversation that you just mentioned. Well, and I would say the difference is I just was not at a place where I was ready to receive it. Yeah. It's so amazing to me. Like, how does that work? You know, where uh, the conversion itself always fascinated me. How it, it, as you well know, it happened on its own time, on its own schedule, in its own way. And as missionaries, we didn't really have too much to do with it. Sometimes we provided the right setting or had the right scriptures, but it was outside of us, obviously, or we would have baptized a whole lot more people, right? I served in South America, so I did baptize a whole lot of people. <laughs> and I was lucky. I baptized decently for an in-state mission, but I I realized on my mission, I don't have control over this. You know, there was this big push. If you're more obedient, you will have higher numbers. If you just work harder, it'll translate into higher numbers. No, it didn't. Like, I'll be honest. <laughs> I can say this in all humility. I kept every rule. except that I did read those uh, Hugh Nibley lectures. Yeah, I broke that rule too, and I got in trouble for it. Like my heart was in the right place. I worked my tail off. I loved, I put up with crazy companions and they put up with me. (laughs) And like, I was a good one. And it didn't have anything to do with me. And I've also come to a place where I'm, because it used to bother me as I began to deconstruct. I'm like, well, what about the good times I had in Mormonism? What about these people that, came to the gospel because of me. So what, what about that now? What about them? And it was so awesome when I came to this place of grace and I was able to just let it go and trust they'll be okay. Like every step I took within Mormonism brought me to where I'm at now. And so who's to say it's not part of your journey, which is why I appreciate Scott, your perspective that you have on this podcast, that you allow people their journeys and their perspectives Because we can't all be the same. As you said, we can't all embrace the same perspectives, the same concepts at the same time. It doesn't work that way. Well, it's no fun. And life would be boring. Yes. I mean, Scott, if there weren't apostates like you and me, who would people gossip about and get all riled up about, right? Do you know how many people we're going to upset by this podcast? We're providing the spice of life. That's awesome. That's true. <laughs> so I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I will always love studying religion academically. I do not see myself as religious anymore. Okay. I love studying it, but I'm not religious at all. I guess I would ask one question and you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but do you believe that God exists? And by that, I mean any sort of supernatural power that may or may not have some level of influence in the universe. I'm, I'm with you on that one. I don't know. There are times when I think maybe there are times when I think my definition of God is too narrow. Like I've got to, I've got to open it up. Yes. What does that mean? Because I was going to answer your question with a question. (laughs) (laughs) Define to me what God is, right? Um, Well, I tried to, I tried to frame it in a way where it was really broad. (laughs) I have come to a place where when anything miraculous happens in my life, whether it's because I thought I prayed for it or someone else prayed for it or, you know, the powers that be willed it, I have come to a place where I just have a sense of awe and gratitude, but I quit trying to figure it out. I think for me, as I've learned to just embrace my life with gratitude and not uh, try and know why or how these things happened. I mean, I've had some very traumatic experiences where, because I was very scrupulous religiously, when my prayers didn't come to pass and I wasn't praying for myself, I was praying for others. It broke me, right? Like what's wrong with me? Why don't I have enough faith? And that led to some very unhealthy, uh, self harm. I lived that as well. I've just come to this place where I, the brain is miraculous and the capacity to hope, you know, the placebo effect, who knows what power that has, but I'll tell you what, I do believe something's there, whether it's all of our joint consciousness, like you said, um, these energies that always have been these very biological at their base level 
uh, components that have the ability to connect and deconnect and recreate life. There's something there. And I'm just open for the ride now. And I'm loving it. Like, I'm a lot happier than I have ever been. But the transition was very painful. The way you were talking, and this was just from a moment before, but the way you were talking, and and correct me if I'm projecting or saying something that may not be true, but as you deconstructed, you have felt more compassion for yourself and for yeah. everyone else in the world. You did not make that up. That is true. I, I knew I was on my journey of deconstruction, as I said, in graduate school, when I started to really understand grace. And this idea, you know, in the scriptures, I think it's first John, we love him because he first loved us. Jesus is this symbol of universal love and acceptance. And in, in the Jesus embodiment, in the story of Jesus of Nazareth, we've got this person who we can relate to that loves us unconditionally and has done it all for us. In him, we have hope, right? But when you can step back and deconstruct, um, I started to realize that that myth, that story, however you want to believe it, that truth, whatever it is, it allowed me to come to a place where I loved myself. I had to feel like someone else loved me first and it had to be God, but it allowed me to then come to this place where I realized if I'm loved or I feel acceptance, let's put it that way. If I feel this much compassion and grace for myself, it's, it's like, um, surely then everyone else deserves that as well. Yes. It's, it's almost the natural connection that you make once you start accepting yourself. Yes, that is, that is so true. It's almost like, like a switch turns on and you start to see again, going to like the Eastern tradition, when you put your palms in front of your face and you say, namaste, that is beautiful. (laughs) Like that is beautiful because you're basically saying, I see you, you see me. And we both have greatness within us and good, like live your life, you know, (laughs) like awesome, wonderful. (laughs) You do you. It's just, it's this beautiful thing. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm walking my days with more awe and wonderment and less frustration, less feeling of I'm not enough. I need to do more. Yeah. And just more compassion for myself, for others. It's great. The crazy thing about all of this, and, and you mentioned a moment ago, our perspectives from before, you know, if a younger you, missionary you could look at you now, how they would be appalled or they would be just so baffled that you could ever make this decision. But this change has brought so much happiness in you from from what you're expressing to me. And and life life still has hardship. I don't want to gloss over and you know oh, say, yeah. but everything the is the Buddhist you know. in me. Life is suffering, <laughs> right? Like recognizing that is the first step. So surely, yeah, yeah. It's almost like the believer in the church is incapable of seeing the happiness on the other side. Like if it's, it's almost like the answers to a believer are what equate the happiness. But when someone has deconstructed and they don't have answers, that's when they find peace. (laughs) See, and there you find mysticism. That is a mystic concept. And it's it. When I was a true blue Mormon, I rejected that with every fiber of my being. You're right. The happiness wasn't the answers. And in my mind, we'll never all fully feel that Zion feeling until we all quote unquote get it. And then it's like I woke up one day and I realized as the gospels teach us, right? This is a mystic concept. The kingdom of heaven is within you. The kingdom of heaven is now. And that that kind of, that just that approach to any religious teaching. I think you can take any major world religion and pull out those mystical components that allow your life to be transformed right now. And I feel like too many Mormons are holding out for, let's say the eternities, right? So, oh, my family can be eternal. So I've got to crack down on the dogma now. So we can be, but what happens? You, you end up hurting people. You end up isolating yourselves from maybe your gay son or gay daughter. Just that that kind of justified uh, self righteousness, and you think you're you're okay in, in being this way because this is what God expects of you. And if you tell the line, then one day families can be together forever. But in the meantime, we're ripping them apart because, you know. Jesus never said, don't keep my commandments to use a popular thing I'm seeing a lot of. <laughs> um, 
and it just saddens me. I think we are letting our families slip from our hands. We're letting go of the hands of our brothers, our sisters, our fathers, our mothers out of an idea of something that may or may not be in the future because we're not living in the now. And it's tragic. It is tragic. Well, I have loved (laughs) this discussion. Scott, I sure hope it's what you had hoped for in some way, because I just, I'm looking at my notes and I'm like, huh. And I definitely spoke too much about my being terminated. That's okay. If you want to know it a little in a more distinct and carefully crafted way, go to my blog. But yes, I will post a link for listeners to go and read that and explore her blog. She has some awesome articles about mother in heaven and, and a wide variety of other subjects that are just so cool. The priesthood. Yeah. Oh man. That was another thing my bishop was like, he was not comfortable with. And I said, well, can you point out to me the specific points I made that are you're uncomfortable with? Because I feel like they're rooted in scripture and history and I'm doing what president Nelson asked us to do. And he, that was not a good perspective to take with him because <laughs> that made him more uncomfortable. And he said, well, I can't, I can't actually tell you what, I just know the tone of your essay makes me feel like you're walking the line of apostasy. And I'm like, oh, brother. <laughs> but see, when an actual understanding of history is apostasy, that is so Orwellian. Oh, it, it's, it's terrifying, actually. And I realized that's when I kind of started embracing this term apostate. Because I thought, well, then I'm in good company, right? (laughs) I'm with the Martin Luthers and I'm with the Galileos and I'm with anyone. People, which ironically we celebrate in Mormonism. Oh, yes. But it's like, oh, but now the thinking's been done. Now we're already there. We've made the progress. <laughs> they were inspired by God to do that. But you know, now that the church is here, you know, he's never going to inspire anyone else to, we're good. to rebel. And, the, and only the 15. <laughs> I, that's another thing. I know we're way over time, but it has been so disappointing for me to see so many social media posts about the church because the, with this recent uh, debate over Elder Holland's comments to the CES faculty. And so many conservative members are saying, You might be upset, but the church is not influenced by the attitudes or pressures of society. And I'm thinking, (laughs) really? You guys like. Then you're not paying attention because that's the only thing that affects change. (laughs) It breaks my heart. And these young return missionaries are like wearing this on their sleeve. And I think, man, it's going to hurt when your paradigm cracks wide open. But guess what? That's why your podcast is here, Scott. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to help as much oh, as I can. Oh, <laughs> man. But I'm just like, yeah, it's like, what, what church history are you reading? You have to know a little bit of societal and cultural context for a lot of these changes. But the, and the church isn't teaching that. So they have to find it elsewhere. Because frankly, they're not going to get it in church. No, you're not. Or you end up with a situation like me <laughs> where you're ousted and then the witch hunt begins. So... The strengthening the members <laughs> committee exists. It does. It does. It is It is there and probably listen, listening to us right now. I love it. Bring it on. <laughs> Call me in. Let's, let's have a discussion. None of this behind closed doors business. If you're listening, give me a call. Love to chat. Shoot me an email. I would love to chat. That's right. That's <laughs> I'll bring right, you on Scott. the podcast. <laughs> oh, well, thank you again for having me. And This has been a pleasure. I would love to have you back. I think that there are a lot more subjects that we might be able to together tackle. And yeah, and you are welcome anytime. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I think in the next six months with general conference coming up and whatnot, I have a feeling we'll have some things to discuss. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Yep. Have a great night. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to the episode today. I hope that you enjoyed the interview with Kaisa as much as I did. Our chat was so engaging. I felt so refreshed afterwards. And I look forward to bringing her back onto the podcast to discuss some of the other projects and things that she's working on. Thanks for sticking it out. I know these these last two episodes have been, been a bit longer format than my previous ones. But this content and... Kaisa's story is important to share because I think it's, I think it illustrates the need for nuance in the church, especially with the way the church is directed and how there really isn't a space for it yet. And until that happens, the church is going to lose members like her 
and like many of us, because there's no space for someone to disagree, no space for someone to think for themselves or, or have a different opinion on, on anything. I hope that you have an excellent day. <laughs>